Let me just say a few thoughts and words about Palm Sunday. And you know, you know you'll understand where, why I'm going and why, uh, what direction I'm going. I always have enjoyed the special days of the year, especially we call them religious events or the days of the year. You know, Thanksgiving and Christmas, and of course, uh, we have Easter and Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Mother's Day and Father's Day, and, and uh, there's Grandmother, Grandparents' Day, and all the other days. They're not quite religious, but anyhow, we try to make them that way sometimes. So, uh, so when I thought of uh, uh, the tenth day of the month of April, when Pastor asked me about three weeks ago, I said, oh, oh, this is going to be easy. And uh, it, it isn't easy. Don't you know, clue yourself. But anyways, uh, I had uh, some thoughts in mind, and so immediately I turned and read, read the uh, Matthew chapter 21, a portion of scripture we read this morning in the events of leading up to the triumphal entry and entering the, the temple and so on and so forth. Uh, I was greatly intrigued about all the events. Sometimes we forget some of the details along the way. Uh, if he had rode into Jerusalem on a horse, what would that mean? It'd mean war. But he came in a donkey, which means peace. I was intrigued also by the replies of the, of the Pharisees in the temple, but also even before that, they did, Matthew doesn't record this, but Luke chapter 19 records in verses 39 and 40, the, the words what they said to Jesus as, as the people began to praise the Lord as he came into the, the, the city and up to the temple. And they said to him, why don't you make these people stop? They, those are the vernacular words for the day. Uh, and he said, well, if they did, even the stones would cry out and praise me. And of course, in the temple, he, they said to him, why don't you the children stop singing, saying those words? And uh, interesting, children love to sing. Sometimes they sing with their inside the house with their outside voice. Brothers, you understand? Sure you do. <laughs> but they have a jubilant sort of way sometimes about them. And I enjoy about that. I didn't probably enjoy them when I was a father and our girls were home. I, we have three girls and they, they always uh, made a lot of extra noise. Uh, we rented a house one time that had just two bedrooms. They were two large bedrooms on the second floor. This whole house was, looked like they, it was uh, from the colonial days. They had two great big mammoth pillars out front, or three great big mammoth pillars, fluted column pillars in front that were that size. And uh, I call it the Thomas Jefferson house. So, in fact, our daughter just sent me a picture of that when she visited Cortland, New York, and where we lived at that time. And our girls would go to bed, and we turned the lights out, and Lucille and I would go get in, in bed, and we lay there a few minutes, and all of a sudden they hear this sound, the sound of singing. And the girls all slept in the same room. They were a double bed and a single bed in that room, and their dressers and all that kind of stuff, and they, were, they, they would sing and sing and sing. Our middle girl, Debbie, who lives in Mechanicsburg, is more of a singer and a leader in that at regards and often, often sang as we were on deputation. But they sing, they love to sing. I thought about also the fulfillment as it says here in Matthew's portion here in Matthew 21, the fulfillment of scripture. And this is a fulfillment of scripture. Uh, Zach, uh, Zechariah and several other portions of the Old Testament indicate that very well. Then I thought about the words that the children are saying and the words of the people were saying. And I thought these certainly represent the word P-R-A-I-S-E. What is it, class? Praise. Praise. 
Most praise comes from those who are filled with a sense of joy in, in whom, whom God is and how he deeply, deeply is committed to his people. Praise exalts the Lord. It is in praise that the believer acknowledges his dependency upon the, on God and his greatness and his goodness. And oft times these words of praise work their way down in the heart and they're changing the life till they're the individual, the believer in Christ and a child of God changes his lifestyle to be obedient to him who is his Lord, L-O-R-D. That's capital L-O-R-D, Lord. As I thought about the word praise, I thought of not so much the, the triumphal entry, all that was certainly on my mind, but I thought about a, several Psalms of scripture and so if you have your copy of, of your scriptures, I'm going to ask you to take and turn to that portion. It's Psalm 145, 145. And I want you to look very carefully at the heading of this psalm. It says, Psalm 145, David's uh, psalm of praise. What's that mean? It didn't say... It doesn't mean that he, he uh, wrote it so much, and it's his personal favorite one. In fact, Spurgeon says in his, in his uh, commentary that this psalm is David's very own favorite one. That means what? That he would sing it often, or say it often, or think about it often. Uh, uh, at our men's gathering this month, I asked them if they had any favorite tools from their toolbox. And uh, somebody said, yeah, I have a utility knife. And I said, yeah, you're a cut up, aren't you? So, uh, yeah, we do have favorite tools. We do have favorite things. And so this is David's favorite. He uses it often. Doesn't, don't you use your favorite uh, utensil? Mothers in the kitchen, ladies, you have something very, you use it often, often, often. And you know all about what it can do. So it is. David knows all about these words in this psalm. And uh, G. Campbell Morgan emphasizes three things in this psalm. And it's majesty, might, and mercy. Uh, some uh, commentators and preachers always have uh, the words beginning with the same letter. You notice that? Well, we're going to do the same thing today. We're not going to talk specifically about majesty, might, and ma at mercy, but I'd like to take the text itself and see what the text says about God himself. And so, as we look at this psalm, I trust that you'll notice some interesting things. We're going to look at the greatness of our God. We're going to look at his graciousness of our God and uh, the goodness of our God. All these words are found in our text here in Psalm 145. I'm going to read verse 3 because this highlights the greatness of our God. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. I'll read it one more time. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Before, before I started looking at these three, I uh, wrote them down on a sheet of paper. And then I said, okay, I, I'm not sure I understand the word greatness. I need to define something here. So I looked in my, um, you know, Dr. Noah Webster's dictionary. I have one of those. In fact, I have three or four of those. Uh, and I looked up to the word greatness. And this is what I found. This is what it means. And many more that we probably could go on forever. Extensive, extreme, outstanding, remarkable, superior. That's who, what our God is. 
He's beyond. Outstanding, remarkable, superior. He's also unsearchable. We just read verse 3. Unsearchable. We cannot find everything out about our God. I had an unsaved man say to me, you know, with all this war and all this heartache that's in the world, why does God allow this to happen? And I said to him, if you and I could tell why he allows it to happen, would we be God too? No, we're not God. We'll never understand some things that God does. Sometimes God allows us to have an illness, but that illness brings us to the place where we depend more upon him like we ought to. Some times the Lord allows us to go through events in our lives that will draw us to the place where we'll depend on him more. So he will receive the glory and honor and praise above all things. That's why he's great. Unsearchable. Secondly, his greatness makes him worthy of the praise. Verse 4 and verse 5. One generation shall praise thy works to another and shall declare thy mighty acts. And I speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and thy wondrous works. Yes, his, he's worthy of praise. This uh, praise and greatness applies to his power. I'm going to have you turn with me to several portions of scripture to share some concerning his power. Uh, over in Exodus uh, chapter 15, Exodus 15, we find an interesting song recorded. It's called the Song of Moses. Now, just the words are recorded here, but uh, musicians have tried to put some of these words to music and the, the tunes, uh, and they have tried to sing some of these songs, and one, one person has done that, and I'm not going to try to sing that this morning, but, uh, but it tells very similar the words here in Psalm, uh, uh, Exodus 15. It, it says, and Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I'll prepare him an habitation in my father's house. And I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his hosts have been he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also have, are drowned in the Red Sea. Uh, you almost can visualize what's taking place. All of us know scripture, if we read some concerning prior to this time, that God actually uh, made Pharaoh and his army desire to come out of the Egypt and to follow the children of Israel as they were going into the desert. And God led them to the desert for that purpose, to draw, I believe, to draw Pharaoh and his forces out of Egypt, to destroy them. And he came up to the, the sea, and there was a cloud separating the army, and I'm doing the short version, okay? <laughs> separating, separating the Egyptians and his army and the children of Israel, because they had already started cross, cross the Red Sea on dry ground. And so they followed them. As the cloud moved, they moved forward until it had drawn all the forces in the center of the sea. The high waters, banks of waters, the waves high above their heads, 20, 30 feet, I'm sure. And then God says, it is enough. And all the water came upon them. And this is why Moses sang this song. This song. And so, uh, great, great praise to God. God is the one rejoicing what he's done. I'd like to go to verse 16 of this uh, chapter 15. Fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thy arm they shall be 
uh, still as stone till thy people pass over. O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. God wanted his people, but his greatness of his, sometimes he calls it the right, his right arm. I might say, I wish I could lead a little better. My, I'm having a difficulty. You know, I, you get older, you have this thing, you know, a friendly comes and he says, Arthur, you know Arthur? Right, he gets into your bones and your joints and it's kind of hard to do this all the time, you know. And so, <laughs> the greatness of our God, it is he. This applies also to God's name. Uh, David, uh, desiring to build a house of God, and uh, he prayed, O oh Lord, there is none like thee, neither is there any God besides thee, according to all that we have, have heard with our ears. What nation in the, on the earth is like thy people, Israel, whom you went to redeem to be your own people to make thee a name of greatness and terribleness? That's First Corinthians, uh, Colossians. Yeah. 17 verses 20 to 21. In that same book, uh, a few verses, a few chapters beyond, uh, David had numbered the people, which he should not have done. And uh, God sent a prophet by the name of Gad. Chronicles chapter 21, I don't have to look this up, 11 through 13. And uh, sent a the prophet Gad, who was in, the, in your Bible, so I'll probably say seer, and uh, he came, David, and told him uh, that it was uh, a sin to do what he did. And the, he says, I deliver this message from the Lord, and the Lord gives you three things to choose from. You can have three years of famine, or you can have three months uh, being for your foes to destroy you, or it could be three days of of being placed in the hands and then the, with the sword of the Lord. And David said this. He, David replied, "I am in great straits. Let me fall now in the hand of the Lord. For very many are His mercies, but let not me fall in the hands of a man." So David recognized that the hand of the Lord was of less difficulty than the hands of men. There is a psalm, Psalm 100, Psalm 126, verse 3. It says, The Lord hath done great things for us, wherever we, where, whereof we are glad. We're glad for the great things he has done. Oh, by the way, by the Psalm 126, actually Psalm 120 through almost 130 is the Psalms of degrees. Someone says, what's that mean? Are they hot or cold? Well, it's not hot or cold. Uh, Hezekiah, it is said that Hezekiah had a big sundial and uh, he was in the battle, he had to win the battle. He turned to, the, uh, the sun went backwards 10 degrees, I believe, on this sundial. And so uh, it came to be that these songs that often are sung when they came back from the uh, uh, time in Babylon and came up the, of the uh, mountain to the top of the mountain towards Jerusalem. As they walked along, they would sing and chant these songs of degrees. The greatness of God. It applies to his personality as well, his person. Deuteronomy 32, verses 3 and 4. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe thy greatness unto my God. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. And a God of truth without iniquity, just and right is he. 
Uh, some of these words we know quite well as we've read them and memorized them. His greatness should be declared. Let's look in our Bible. Uh, back to the Psalm, Psalm 124. Uh, Psalm 145, I'm sorry. Uh, Psalm says, 145, verse 6, it says, And men shall speak of the mighty acts. And men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and will declare thy greatness. Uh, verse 12, To make known the son, to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. So it is. We could read well, even going back up to, to uh, Psalm uh, 145 or verse uh, 3 of God's greatness, unsearchable. But we also could say that his greatness is excellent. I, I'm going to turn just five Psalms over and read Psalm 150 verse 2. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Excellent greatness. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Great praise for his great, this great God we serve and love. Every part of his greatness is worthy to be praised. The smallest greatness is greater than man's greatness. Think about that. His Smallest greatness is greater than man's greatness. So he is great. Our God is also a gracious God. And this psalm we're looking at, Psalm 145, and we're going to look at verse 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. I looked up this word graciousness and the best thing we can say it's a manifestation of the word grace grace a very gracious person is one who is kind compassionate merciful slow to anger all these are things these apply to to the Lord himself some some people particularly unsaved people think of the Lord as being severe or harsh, or angry, but God, the Lord, is gracious. Psalms eighty-six, fifteen. But Thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion, and gracious, and long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalm one hundred three, verse eight. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. I could, there's several other psalms that we could look at. Uh, I have a whole series of psalms here. How, when do you want to go home? <laughs> I'll cut out some of them. He hath, this is Psalm 111, verse 4. He hath made his wondrous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. Psalm 116, verse 5. Gracious is the Lord and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. Joel chapter 2 and verse 13. Rent your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord our God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. I'm reminded of what Jonah said after he disembarked the belly of the whale and preached his sermon at, in Nineveh. And the city repented. And, and then Jonah prayed to the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and great in kindness. He wanted God to liquidate Nineveh. Probably some of the same feelings that have reached up from the lower part of your heart in regard to some country that interferes with the other countries. 
and have destroyed a great deal in the last few weeks. Our God is a gracious God. First Peter chapter three, verse three is, so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Someone has wrote a little statement about God. God treats his creatures with kindness. God treats his subjects with consideration. God treats his saints with favor. Even those who refuse his grace still shares God's long suffering toward them. Oh, if they don't even come to know him and trust in him, God is gracious to us and to the world. So he's, gra he's great, he's gracious, and he's good. Before we look at the verse that we want to refer to here in the psalm, uh, I try to define the word good or goodness. And so I found these words. They're just a few of the many that were there. Highest quality, uprightness, genuine, uh, and then another the little prayer, for, uh, small things like this. It says, for real. Okay. Our God is for real. He's genuine. So let's look at this for these verses here. Verse 7. They shall abundantly utter the memories of thy great goodness and shall sing of thy righteousness. Verse 9. The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Interesting verses here as we see them. He is abundant, abundant, abundant. A large tro a truck, a, a lo lo load of hay, abundant. More than enough. Verse uh, 19 of Psalm 31 says this, Oh, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. Uh, Psalm 33, five, I love righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of his goodness. Full of his goodness. Wonderful certainly abundant goodness. So we have a God who is great. We have a God who is gracious. We have a God who is good, good to us, even though sometimes we may not view it that way. Full of goodness above all else. Most of the time this goodness is for our own satisf satisfaction. That we be satisfied. Psalm 65 verse 4 says, Blessed is the man whom you choose and have caused to approach you, that he may dwell in thy courts. He shall be satisfied with goodness of thy house, even the holy temple. And certainly I remember Nehemiah as he brought the people of God back to Israel, back to Jerusalem. And he just felt that they had to be reminded of a few things. He wanted to remind them and rehearse the events that took place when they came out of Egypt, how good God was to them. And God will do that again for them, even now as they came back to nothing but ruins in Jerusalem and around about there. And so he began to talk to them about what took place in Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 25, we find these words, and they took, they're referring to them as coming back from Egypt, he took, they took strong cities and a fat land, in other words, a rich land, possessed houses full of all goods and, dug, and wells that were already dug, vineyards that were already planted, olive groves that were already growing, fruit trees in abundance. So they did eat and were filled and became fat 
and delighted themselves in thy great goodness. The great goodness of God. See, when they came back from Babylon, there wasn't any of those things. It was nothing but destruction left in ruins. But God, our God, is good to us. And sometimes we need to be reminded of these three things. I think God wants us to continue to, to think about that, to rehearse it again, to assure our hearts again and again and again about these different things. My wife and I have a little habit. We've made it a habit. Shall I tell them about the habits we have, dear? Okay, one habit is, it's a good habit, as we, we read the scriptures twice a day, uh, some way or another, in the morning, we read, uh, try to read through the whole Bible in a year. Uh, some or another, it's getting so, we spend more time thinking about what we're reading and making comment, and we don't read quite as many chapters that we originally intended to read. We just read three chapters or so, or four chapters a day. You can get through from, from Genesis to Revelation, see. So, uh, reading along, and it was interesting, don't know, that we came to one psalm, Psalm 107. It's a, thanks, a song of thanks. Uh, and, but it has a little, this little psalm, which is a song, it has a chorus in it. And the chorus is found in verse 8, and verse 15, and verse 21, and verse 31. And it goes like this. this the chorus is like this. After they're talking about the different things that God has done, and, uh, and uh, what Israel did, and so on and so forth, it says, All oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. And again, All oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. All oh, that men would praise the Lord, and so on. Uh, if I finally think, I think it's getting in. Okay. And sometimes our songs we sing, we have the chorus there. I think it's there for that purpose. To help us to remember who God is. In Second Thessalonians, that's the New Testament, chapter 1 and verses 11 and 12, it says this, For also we pray always, for you that our God would count you worthy of his calling and fill all with the good pleasures of his goodness and the works of faith with power. The goodness of the Lord. So, who is our God? He is not one that's made with hands. It has eyes that do not see. It ears that do not hear. That hands that perform nothing, that cannot move. We have a God who is great, great, superior than all others. We have a God who is gracious, giving beyond and despite of. When David sinned and came back to God, his heart pled with God to forgive his sin and cleanse his life. And God was willing to do that and more because he allowed David to stay in the kingship and to be used of him in the days to come. Yes, God, many times as we fail, God overlooks, he forgives us, he cleanses us, gives us strength to go on, go on to serve him. Trust in God. He will be a gracious God and also a good God because of his goodness. I'll read that verse again. That uh, is the prayer of the, uh, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonians. Thereof also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasures of his goodness and the works of faith with power. I think these three, greatness, graciousness, 
and goodness does something for us. If we remember them, God's greatness leads us to praise. We can praise him for what he has done, for his greatness. His graciousness leads us to prayer. And to thank him with our lips and our heart. And his goodness leads us to pursuit. To be willing to step out and to ready to follow wherever he leads or whatever he directs in our lives. I know that's the three P's on my page here besides the others of, of G's. But that's all right. It helps us to remember, doesn't it? Good, greatness, goodness, uh, excuse me, greatness, graciousness, and goodness. Yes, praise, prayer, and pursuit. Great to serve the Lord. He is God, and there's none other like on him on the face of the earth or heaven. Someday we'll appreciate him as we are with him in his presence. He's coming soon, as the songwriter said, as order written. I trust you'll be ready to meet him face to face. Father, thank you for these thoughts this morning. Thank you for your graciousness. Thank you for guiding our steps. Thank you for allowing these simple lips to draw our attention to these things. Guide us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.